Thanks, guys. How are you? Good morning. Um, so I will. Um, this is tough because you know filmmaking is about 120 years old, and if you really want to go to town, we could talk about the sequential art and the visual medium and storytelling through pictures, going back all the way to um, Egyptian stone carvings. But we're going to stick with uh, America today, mostly. All right, and we're going to stick with maybe the last 20 years. Uh, and of course, we're going to do this in 20 minutes, so we're going to scratch the surface of a surface that's hidden beneath a giant surface, all right? So get your fingernails ready. Um, the goal of today's uh, lecture is to explain to you how genius filmmakers completely uh, ruin your lives sometimes, and uh, maybe also lift you up and make you a happier person. Um, uh, emotional manipulation is the genius of any great filmmaker. As in, you're going to walk into any given film expecting something, begging for something, right? Be it a horror film, you say, I want you to scare me. And if you don't, I'm going to say your movie sucks, right? And uh, on the other hand, you go see a great Oscar winning drama and you're going to say, I want you to lift me up. I want you to teach me about life. I need you to gift me with wisdom, right? And you better do it in 90 minutes. And uh, if it's a bad film, you'll get angry. You'll tell your friends. And it's not a bad film. It's a film. It, it did what it was supposed to do. The question is, did it impact you, the viewer? All right? You ever, you ever had any instances where you have a great favorite <clears throat> guilty pleasure movie, and you tell your friend about it, and your friend says, I absolutely hated that, and you can't understand why? Raise your hand if you've had a disagreement over a film. So there are no bad films. There are no good films. There's only good and bad people. <laughs> All right? So the pitch of today is to ruin films for you, all right? And what I want you to do is walk away from this 20 minutes, completely seen through the facade that's created by filmmakers to emotionally manipulate and lie to you every day of your lives. You beg for an experience that is fabricated, doesn't exist ever, is not real. That horror film that made you scared after 90 minutes, it wasn't real. And your emotion is very real, isn't it? But it's not, because it's not inspired by anything directly affecting you, right? So that's the whole pitch of today. We're going to dissect this with five giant tools. There are five main tools that every filmmaker uses. Do they use them well to hit your heart of hearts or your heart of hearts? That's the question you'll have to answer when you actually go to the movies tonight, all right? Uh, so five tools. Big fat number one coming up is called mise-en-scene, which is a French term uh, for basically what is in your square or your rectangle or your picture. And it's derived, it's a term that was derived from the stage. Uh, as in, we'd say, the director was in charge of the mise-en-scene, right? Uh, as in, uh, when you're looking at a stage, you have foreground, background, left, right, up, down, and so on. All right, now, this is a still from Citizen Kane, and uh, no good film lecture would be worth anything without Citizen Kane kicking it off, all right? Uh, so this is, um, if, if, if I were to get a Citizen Kane tattoo, this would be the one. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this movie, I'm really sorry. For those of you who have, get ready. That's Kane, all right? He's just been abandoned by everyone in his life that he thought he loved or loved him back. He's discovered that even though he's the richest man in the world, has every single thing at his fingertips, can achieve anything, including creating a great opera with a terrible singer, all right? Yet still, no one loves him, and he loves no one back. So he's walking through his giant mansion, and you have a hall of mirrors, all right? This shot, funny enough, was completely accidental, completely changed the entire direction of the film that day, and they had to rewrite the entire day's schedule because they fell in love with this exact design. And what you have is a mirror after a mirror after a mirror after a mirror after a mirror. This is mise-en-scene used to visually affect you and create an emotion. The emotion being, Kane is all alone. So in case you were walking through this film completely ignorant of the entire film's plot, Right? and then just walked in on this exact scene, this tells you perfectly what this man's emotional state is. Perfect use of mise-en-scene, because this is something you can't quite see or describe or read. This is something you only feel by seeing it. It's an indescribable vibe that you receive from the film, and that is why it's timeless, because it's filled with this type of genius. All right, Pure mise-en-scene comments on the plot and makes you feel it. Now, we as human beings are unfortunately are not judgmental, terrible people. And the uh, first 10 seconds of a movie, followed by the first two minutes, followed by the first 10 minutes, are your three stages of accepting the film as great or terrible. No joke. Who here has walked out of a film after 10 minutes? Or turned it off on Netflix after two minutes? 
right? Or clicked OK accidentally and then watched the first 30 seconds and decided it wasn't for you. This is what happens. Now you tell me, as human beings who are non-judgmental creatures and very proud souls who accept everyone completely, <laughs> correct? <laughs> All of you are, I know this. What kind of person lives in this house? This is a picture of a real bedroom, I want hands. Anyone? What kind of person do you think lives there? What's their income level? What's their gender? What's their sexual orientation? Yes? High, wealthy person. High, wealthy person. Great. Married? Single? Married. Married? Excellent. Female. Female? Sexual orientation? We could get crazy with this. Okay? <laughs> now, here's what's fun. I just showed you a picture of a bed, all right? And I can tell you right now that a serial killer lived there. Sorry, guys. That's actually a crime scene. Okay, but you wouldn't believe me, would you? So if I'm gonna set up some mise-en-scene for a rich guy, this is what I'd choose. Get where I'm going? I showed you one shot, you knew exactly who lived there in about two seconds later, right? Now alternately, who lives here? <laughs> Come on, you non-judgmental, beautiful humans. <laughs> you get where I'm going, right? Okay, mise-en-scene. Uh, also known as production design to Americans. Now, cinematography, you go through film school, you're gonna see this shot a, a million times in a row. Anybody name the film? Quiz time, people. It's one of the best American films ever made, top 100 according to the AFI. It's got a car. The Graduate, thank you guys. Now, if my clip would play, let's get it going here. If my clip would play, there's a couple different aspects to cinematography. The main one is the lens, all right? What you have are three different choices of lens, long, short, and medium. It's super simple to remember, all right? This is shot with a short lens that elongates the space, or it could be shot with a long lens that crushes the space, okay? And what that is is that foreground and background material that we're talking about through cinematography. One cinematographer can make great choices to emphasize certain things in a film, all right? Again, to talk to you poetically through the visual medium and actually make you feel what is happening versus try to translate what's happening. All right, and what you have here, anybody know the plot of this movie? What's happening right now? He's looking for the church because his girlfriend's going to get married and uh, his girlfriend's mom hit on him and he had some major issues, right? <laughs> so what's going on here is one of the most famous American shots ever, and it's him running for the church. All right, and we've used a very specific lens selection to compress space. And if we want him to run for 20 seconds of screen time, but make it feel like two hours of screen time, what are we going to do? We're going to choose a great lens. And so you'll watch him. He's running. This is one block, one block. And he's running. And he's running. He's going to get there. And we're trying your patience a little bit. <laughs> and now my computer is stalled. He's still running, I promise. <laughs> you see the point, right? Yeah. So to emphasize this journey, we're going to make you feel it, right? Now this is called aspect ratio here. This is full on cinemascope. Aspect ratios have changed throughout time. This is from a movie called Hidalgo about a horse race, all right? And what you have here is a gigantic, epic, massive horse race shot in a giant rectangle, pure cinemascope. Aspect ratios evolved as humanity started to uh, invent greater ways for you to entertain yourselves, all right? We have 3D, we have smell-o-vision, okay? We go 133 to 185, the first ever widescreen, which says, your TV, it's square. Well, our movies, they're rectangles, it's crazy. All right, and, and so on and so forth. And every single time, if you trace film history, you'll find home video, such as Netflix, creating obstacles for actual movie going. And movie going has to come up with new reasons for you to actually leave your house and experience something. The newest craze, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called beer in a restaurant, I don't know. Eh? <laughs> 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 All right, now this is a shot from Frankenstein, 1933. This is shot in a square, 133 Academy aspect ratio. You see the difference in size immediately, right? So if we want to make a grand epic like Lord of the Rings, we're going to make it big and scope and huge and massive so you can see every single detail because you paid 12 bucks for that and you want every single beautiful CGI pixel. Now, with Frankenstein, it's much different. This is one man stuck in, stuck in, turn it up, louder, is that better? Okay, good. Now, you, in Frankenstein, this is Colin Clive playing the actual doctor, all right? And he's telling his little friend there what he did. And they're waiting for the monster to wake up. It's supposed to be scary, okay? And when we actually fast forward a little bit to Frankenstein's first appearance, 
you have it in 133 here, so you're stuck with the characters, aren't you? So a great horror film is really going to make you feel claustrophobic, all right? And when you have a small 133 image, here we have Frankenstein coming out for the first time. Now, when audiences saw this, they screamed out loud. This was the worst terrifying experience ever. And, and you, as beautiful, wonderful Americans today, are going to laugh at it. But here you go, usage of 133 aspect ratio pushing in. Pushing in further, and finally we land on his face. And what this aspect ratio does to you as a viewer is make you completely trapped and stuck with the monster. And you can't do that with scope, can you? Editing. Uh, this would be your number three tool. And these are a bunch of monkeys, I swear to you. They are not humans in little cute, little tiny cute, little adorable Halloween costumes. Uh, this is one of the most famous ever known to man, famous edits ever known to man, um, or monkey. This is the beginning of 2001. It's a nice 25 minute sequence of a bunch of monkeys hitting each other with bones. And it's a symbolic uh, uh, gesture towards where humanity is going. And what you're about to see is Kubrick making this little monkey throw his bone into the air. And these guys just fought each other over territory. Okay, and we might say we've evolved from this moment. Assuming you believe in evolution, this is where we're going. Right? We have the monkey throw a bone up, we have a jump cut, immediately the bone's all of a sudden up again, and all of a sudden the bone turns into a giant spaceship. Right? So with one cut, we have now completely boggled your mind. Now, who saw this the first time and had no idea what was happening? <laughs> You're the smart ones in the room. <laughs> now, the other ones who did know what was happening, how sober were you? <laughs> okay. So what you have here is a bone going up, a jump cut to the bone going up again, which is Kubrick saying, hey, audience, pay attention. You getting ready? Because here it comes, right? You see that jump cut? We don't actually follow the bone so much as we follow its, how do you say, plan of attack. Up and up again. <coughs> That's weird. That makes you jump. You say, what's about to happen? And all of a sudden, the bone's turned into a spaceship. So we have argued a certain religious viewpoint Okay, we have argued that man is still an ape, right? That violence is still prevalent, that our new weapon is our outer space rocket. Okay, we're talking about religion and we're talking about humanity and philosophy. Also, we're fast forwarding a good couple thousand of years, thousands of years in the future, right? With one stinking cut, Kubrick did this. And that's the power. And you don't quite think about it, you just kind of feel it, you know? Here's the other good one. This is from Lawrence of Arabia, and this cut is anything but orgasmic. I fight you on this. Now, what you have here is Lawrence getting ready to go fight some bad guys and venture off into the desert. And uh, one of the best lines ever uttered by anyone is about to come. You have a funny sense of fun, all right? And then you have a cut. Now, what you just saw, let me go back here, what you just saw was an absolute accident <laughs> when they actually made the film, all right? I'm not joking, the editor straight up put the sunset together, because that was the next scene, and he had the match, and he put them together, okay, walked away, didn't even view it. The next morning, his assistant comes into the room, reels it up, and almost has a heart attack over its glory, all right? And what you have is an accidental cut that sets up adventure and excitement and something new beyond the horizon, okay? And if you watch this with a full, like, you know, 7-1 surround sound system, you hear this beautiful little bass hit that just goes boom, all right? <laughs> right when that match gets blown out and the color match from the match leaving to the sun rising establishes just <gasps> this heightened adventure. And you can't just have a guy come up on screen and say, hey guys, Lawrence is really excited. Get ready. <laughs> That's not how it works. That's not poetry. That's not genius. And that doesn't make you feel anything, does it? That makes you feel something. And I can watch that cut forever. Would you like to see it again? Yeah. I'm kidding. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which leads us to uh, sound. Okay. Now, raise your hand if you've heard this before. I'll just uh, let me fast forward a little bit in my beautiful little cut up here. <laughs>
You get the point, right? That's called the Wilhelm scream, and it was discovered by a bunch of dorky uh, filmmakers in the 70s who discovered that this one scream has been part of a sound effects library since uh, about the 30s, and they were using it for a student film, and they discovered that actually a character named Wilhelm gets shot in the leg, on, falls off a horse, and that scream was stock in an actual sound effects library, and it's been used ever since. Now it's become a joke. A true sound designer knows how to hide the Wilhelm scream in a film without you noticing, all right? And it's a true challenge and a game ever since. When Iron Man 2 came out, John Favreau, the director, tweeted when he was in the editing room, he tweeted, just hid the Wilhelm scream, good luck finding it, okay? So it's fun, all right? Now sound effects are incredibly important because they can be A, realistic, or B, completely unrealistic. And whichever way you'd like to view it uh, is actually up to you. So this is a sweet clip from Pirates of the Caribbean. This is sword fighting, all right? Now when you watch this, real quick here, I want you to pay attention to the sounds that the swords make. Crossing right into the pirate, he threw my sword. I made it cool. Those sound like swords, right? Right? Who here is swashbuckled before? <laughs> yeah? Well, how do you know what swords sound like then? It just makes sense, right? Now, did you watch too as they fight? that their swords hit just at the same time as the music is bouncing along, almost like they're dancing with each other. Let me play this again for you. Genius, yes? Now, when you swing swords around, do they go, hoo, hoo, hoo? <laughs> they don't, do they? But that's exciting, isn't it? Right? And the interplay of the sound effects and the music there make this a fun right? A fun sword fight. You're not sitting here scared. You're sitting here going, yeah, yeah, stab each other. Maybe not, because I like you both and you're real pretty, you know? <laughs> so I'll give you one further. Let's talk about sound effects. Here's the same scene from a different angle. Now all you have there is some clever editing, right, and some clever sound effect additions, but what are those? Those aren't swords, what are those? Lightsabers, how do you know that? They don't exist, guys. <laughs> How do you know those are lightsabers? Because it makes sense, right? And I tell you, if we ever did invent a lightsaber, we'd have 50% of America immediately dead. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> this is fun, guys! <laughs> right? There goes Texas and Arkansas all together. Um, so <laughs> I'm from Texas. Sorry, guys. Love you all. Um, so what you have here is, is it's a fake. It's a fake sound effect, right? Completely fake. It's actually a wrench being hit on a, a bridge tie, all right? And, and the reason you guys love it and it makes sense to you is because a lightsaber sounds like a lightsaber because someone told you that it sounds like a lightsaber. And it makes sense, right? If you look at the visuals of what something glowing and sparking and being hit against something might sound like, genius sound designers will sit there and go, what would that sound like? So they take their wrenches and they hit a bunch of stuff and they finally find something that makes sense, right? All right, in this case, it's a bridge tie and that's, that's where we go. Uh, so, so you have lightsaber effects being created by, by sounds that don't exist in real life truly, being applied to things that don't exist in real life truly, coming together and it making sense. When the Three Stooges poke each other in the eyeballs, what sound does it make? It goes boink, right? Now, I dare you guys to poke yourselves in the eyeball right now. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> Liability insurance, you have it, right? It doesn't make that sound, does it? But it's funny, okay? And this is funny because true comedy is about two things that don't belong together. So finally, we land on music, and I leave you with this. Uh, My Best Friend's Wedding is one of the best movies ever made. Don't challenge me. Thank you. <laughs> Don't you dare challenge me. And here's why. The music in My Best Friend's Wedding echoes every single moment of every single emotion that both of these characters are feeling. 
All right. Now I could do without a million different things in this movie, but the soundtrack and how it relates to the picture itself is absolutely genius. And what you have here is this gentleman who's about to marry Cameron Diaz. All right. Mm -hmm. And you have Julia Roberts, who's actually in love with him. Okay. And they've been friends forever. Julia doesn't want to tell him that she's in love with him because she doesn't want to ruin their friendship and ruin his beautiful Cameron Diaz moment. All right. He just is kind of clueless and wondering what's he doing with his life. At this moment, she realizes that she's completely in love with him, absolutely infatuated cannot let this wedding go down. He, of course, like an idiot man, has no idea. He just knows he's dancing with a pretty girl under a bridge. What you're about to see is the music following the song that they sing. And the music gets sad. And the song is supposed to be happy. So the music is in Julia's head, right? The actual music that we hear not on the boat, but actually here in our soundtrack. And in the man's head, you actually hear what's actually being spoken between the two characters. So check this out. Let me know what you think. Sorry, we'll get there. under the bridge and yet another moment is passing them by. Did you hear that? Did you hear that dark undertone making that beautiful happy song absolutely dreadful and tear jerking for poor little Julia? All right. So go watch this movie again with an open mind. All right. And with some friends hopefully that'll encourage you on your journey through it. And uh, I promise you you'll find my best friend's wedding also has moments of genius. Um, that's it for me guys. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you.